Jack, it's been way too long. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you as well. How's it going? Things are great. What a fun shirt. I feel like I next time I should come more appropriately dressed. Uh, actually, uh, this is one of Ethan Page's shirts that he wore. And everybody in the back wanted it. I forget what I bribed him with. It was something. But everyone generally always wants, because he always wears those shirts once on TV and then gets rid of them. And like this was the most prized out of all the shirts. And I can't remember what I bribed him with, but it was something. And he gave it to me. So I call it the shirt of slickness. Just it's to make so slick. Like did you slick. bribe him with money or did you bribe him with like, hey, I'll buy you dinner? I actually think that I kind of guilt tripped him into it and started crap talking everyone else <laughs> about how they didn't deserve it. I can't remember what it was. It was like a year ago now. But if you look back at one of the dynamites, he's wearing this shirt. And then uh, instead of having it thrown in the garbage, I, I yanked that right off of due to guilt or it might have been like chips or something stupid, honestly. Like Wow. It's chips yeah. that you got for free in catering. I like it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Where are we finding you right now? Uh, right now I'm in Acapulco with the family visiting the mother-in-law. So yeah like you're wearing the wristband here is this are you at like a resort uh it's called the imperial hotel and like it's resort tish i want to call it like hard rock level of resort or whatever but it's pretty nice except for the internet so i apologize again ahead of time the internet cuts out at all that's been my only problem i think if you don't move from where you're sitting right now the internet is is beautiful so i think we're making this okay. work right now all right you know, the, the most recent news that came out about you is that AEW is not renewing your contract. And I love the tweet that you put out because it was like you really took the high road and you were like, it was just full of gratitude. Like, thank you for the opportunity. Like, thank you for everything that happened there. Well, yeah. And uh, it's one of those things where I don't actually have like any of these bad experiences or anything. And like, uh, like I said in a follow-up tweet, I don't want to diss myself, but I kind of understand where they were coming from. I don't actually feel that I was really uh, was like giving added value to the company. So like, it's just one of those things, you know, obviously you, being on that AEW salary contract on TV and everything is awesome, but it wasn't, uh, there, it wasn't a bitter breakup or anything by any stretch of the imagination. And I understood where they were coming from. It wasn't like something out of left field, like, so... Well, and they let you ride out, you know, till the end of your contract, which was mm -hmm. great. Which we haven't seen you on TV in a long time. No, not at all. I've been, I've been uh, a darkness writer. <laughs> like, I've been on that dark forever. Uh, but one thing that I really want to actually put AEW over for is uh, waiting your whole contract and not like just, okay, we decided we don't want this guy no more, dump him next week or whatever. So, like, I, it started actually this huge, I didn't want to get involved because then those Twitter fights just are eternal, but it started this huge Twitter fight. And I'm like, I really feel like that's the way to handle it. Like, I, like, I don't know, but. Well, I mean, you're right. So, like you got, you had three solid years there, which yeah. I, I think a lot of people in other companies and we're not going to specifically name any other companies, but other companies, you might sign a three-year deal and you might only be there for a few months. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I, I really like that they honor the length that they told you they were going to give you you know what i mean so yeah i feel like yeah, like if we go way back like you you and i have history in aew like we're a little bit of part of history the very first episode of dynamite you and i and and, and helico shared a segment with kevin smith and jason muse yeah <laughs> like, yeah like I, the crazy to think back about that like we were planning that whole segment together th2 like had a lot of like momentum in that first year of AEW, do you feel like mm -hmm. there was something specific that happened that like caused it to go away? I actually do. I don't, I feel like for that first year, the run actually started out good and we kind of had a little place of like a, like semi comedic tag team. You know what I mean? Not like, like straight comedy or whatever, but like we're doing, doing stuff with like Kevin Smith and then like, a, and we just had a place. And then there was uh, the Mexican border. So me and Angelica were both stuck south of Mexico, got closed for the, the COVID restrictions. And we had this four month layoff. And then I came back, had one match. And then in practice before match, I actually got my face broken again. And then I had another month and a half or two month layoff. And I feel like after that, I never like came back like to full, full. Like I really feel like I deteriorated, like I, I, I there's some I, I can't even blame it on ring rust i don't know what happened but i just i feel like after that 
I never came back. We never had the same momentum, but, but it wasn't one of those things where like, I felt like I was wrestling good and the momentum just didn't get started. Like I felt like I was really had deteriorated in the ring and on the, like, it sounds weird, but it started giving me like these self-confidence problems. Cause like anyone that knows me that's been in the locker room, it was like, I'm so nervous for my match. And I'm like, oh, like I dry heave on the most annoying guy in the locker room. You've ever seen. But then once I stepped through those curtains, like hundred percent confident, even cocky or whatever, but it was like this thing I'd go through the curtain and I'd still be nervous as hell. And like, so it, yeah there was just after that covid layoff and the face break the layoff on the face break i just feel like a, on a personal level like i just never came back to being able to wrestle like me both like character wise like in ring skill wise like anything like that so and uh then also and this is what happened to me all is that salary contract I feel like made me a bit soft because like there was even a little while where like I got a bit like plump like I don't know what the nice way to put it or whatever and like so I just kind of fell off after that layoff and I feel like I only really started getting back on the ball like towards the end and by then I think the company had kind of already made up its mind on me or whatever because like yeah I, I, I did get just kind of like not lazy in the ring necessarily, but I wasn't as good in the ring and I was very lazy outside of the ring. And so like it, it all started with that original COVID layoff and the face break layoff. So it's just so interesting hearing you that like your detriment was being signed to a three-year contract because I'm guessing that this is probably the first time in your career that you had like guaranteed money for three solid years. <laughs> Yeah, even like other times would be kind of guaranteed money, like on Lucha Underground. It was only when they started taping and they would always delay tapings or da da da. But to like just every week know that a check's coming, yeah. like it was great in one way, but like I, I it literally like, I don't want to say it made me, well, yeah, it just kind of made like, it, like I just, it made me soft. Like it totally no fire or nothing. Like I, I just, I wasn't going down and doing the Lucha training. I wasn't, you know, being like, uh, I used to always at least like, you know, like practice a little bit of something just to, to keep up on my skills or anything. And I didn't like, I went through like eight or nine months of just like really nothing. The only exercise I would get would be whatever was in the ring. And, and it, I really do think that it was my fault for, for just getting too. Okay. You're back. Oh no! But did we lose that whole answer? Do I get no, like we we lost about the last maybe thirty seconds of that answer? Okay. Well, I, I'm having internet issues right now, so anyone watching this, a little recap. Basically, after I started getting that salaried money, I turned a bit uh, lazy, <laughs> and and, uh, and I feel it was bad for me, and uh, kind of helped help speed along a deteriorate in ring deterioration. Well, what's interesting, I think, about it is that it was like Angelico got re-signed. So it's like TH2 didn't get re-signed, like, I guess, as a, as a unit, but Angelico got re-signed. So that they, they were looking at you guys as two separate uh, entities, I guess. Yeah, I, I think, again, like at first they weren't. Like you said, that first year, I think they were pretty happy with us. And we were like committed heels. We won, we won and we weren't the type to go up to the office and be like, oh, we want this, that, that, that. We were like... Like I call us nine to five wrestlers, even though it's not technically a nine to five job, but we would just show up, find out what we had to do, go in the locker room, mess around, do what we had to do, you know what I mean? So there's like zero politics and everything for us. And our in-ring performance and what they wanted out of us, you know, it matched that and it was fine. But then after that, I think they kind of started looking mean and helico different because uh, like I said, like, like I got plump, like I just got out of shape and like, I, I just wasn't on the ball at all and Helico never really fell off like he kept steady with you know and Helico being on Helico yeah. so I, I think that that's when they started to view us as two separate entities as like oh man Jack kind of a lazy bum and then Helico is still doing his thing like, uh, like we got to trim the fat you know what I mean so to, but to have the self-awareness right now to say you know what I did get complacent and I did get lazy like I don't think a lot of people would do that. I think a lot of people would try to point fingers rather than pointing them back at themselves. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think that's true. But I just always feel that you got to be realistic like with yourself or else uh, whatever problems it was, wasn't or isn't going to get solved. 
And the other thing is, like I said, because I'm such like a nine to five wrestler, I don't really have anyone else to blame because like, I, except for one incident with 10 where I busted open his lip, but like, and I, uh, which I apologize to hell for, but uh, like, I have no heat with anyone. There was no like, that I know of anyway, there's no like anyone politicking against me. So I don't, I'd have to really like stretch it to like, oh, it was, Chris Harris, you know what I mean? Like, no, it wasn't. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know what I mean? So, like, I think part of the uh, self awareness is just that I don't have another option of anyone to blame because I'm just not knee knee deep in the politics. Like, so like, if, if, if Jack, if you're <laughs> if you're getting released and then Helico's not, like, you both we're always together. We we always are in the same meetings. We talk to the same people. Like, who you're gonna blame? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of obvious who the who the culprit is or whatever you want to call it. it it seemed like during the heart of the pandemic in 2020 the international wrestlers you know had a really tough time because of all yeah. the restrictions with everything had you been in the u.s do you feel like you would have been used more um yeah but i i don't think in the end that would have changed anything i think in the end it really just came down to me having an extend an extended period of laziness and uh so like, yeah, during those four months, or whatever, I probably would have been used more and maybe I would have stayed on the ball a little bit better or whatever if I didn't have that big layoff. I really just think that uh, I didn't have the right mentality when I was getting, when I was on salary. Like, it just felt like it was going to last forever. And like, you know what I mean? Like, so. Okay, we are back with a, a much stronger internet connection, I think. I think. Yes, yes, okay. it is. So I guess the biggest question now, Jack, is like, where do you go from here? What do you want to do with your career now? Um, for right, honestly, I'm not a man with a plan. So for right now, it's just going back to the same old, same old with like uh, indies. And then I'm looking for uh, a promotion to work for in Mexico. So I got to gotta start sending the resume uh, around down here. And just for right now, like, that's just about it. But in all honesty, at my age, it's probably – in a couple of years, it's time to even start thinking about like at least a semi retirement, you know, that's a sad thought to think about. But as of right now, right now, uh, just same old, same old Indies, and I'm hoping to get on TV in Mexico. So you're in Acapulco right now, but where Mexico yeah. City is home for you? Yep, Mexico City is home for me. Acapulco is about four hours away ish. And how long have you lived in Mexico? I've lived in Mexico 11 years now, I think. Wow. Something like that. With all of these videos you've been posting on Twitter with these issues you've been having with the police and oh, oh was... man, being extorted by the police. I, I got to say, like, when you post these videos, I get, I get very worried for you. No, no. Well, no, that's the thing. It's not one of those situations where like, oh, they're going to take me out back and kill me or something. But the thing is, when the police do that, well, they'll they'll plant like they'll find something to charge you with like which just being a, a foreigner and everything it just it makes it a a much like worse deal and there's already one incident where like i almost was facing jail time in mexican prison and so i just wanted to completely avoid it but that's the thing it, where i live you usually I, it's a place called del valle i probably shouldn't like dox myself but you usually don't get anything like that but what those police it wasn't just me is uh my entire building they were just uh like doing that to everyone like my neighbor's son got it like these two guys i call them the drunks because they're always drunk but like man the police beat the crap out of them and then there's also like there's a neighborhood schizophrenic like that uh we, we kind of just let stay in the building and he stays in the fire escape and then like but he's like he's part of the community as weird as it sounds and like they slapped him up and like he didn't even he doesn't have anything he's essentially homeless he like just does little work around the building like you know for different people and they just break him off a little bit of money so like it, it was a weird situation where they just went out of control I, maybe it was other buildings too or other areas around me but specifically on my building but like, if you know anyone that lives in Mexico City, they'll tell you, oh no, that's that stuff happens in like Tapito and like these, like doesn't happen in Del Valle. So it was a very rare, weird thing for it to be happening to where I live.
but it wasn't like just me. Like I think a lot of people on like Twitter that thought I was specifically getting targeted, like for being a foreigner or something. And no, they were just getting everybody. I think the reason they specifically kept coming back for me is the very first time that they got me is I had like $200 American on me. Cause I just always have $200 American in my pocket or in my wallet as like emergency money. And then I had another like two or 3000 pesos on me, which I usually don't keep that. So it, it looked like I was this big score, like to keep coming back to, but man, it, <laughs> I do have to admit it was scary that every time you left, like, you had to be worried because the if the elevator is closed well in the building I live in, then I just take like the stairs. But yeah. man, there were two different times I'd walk around the corner to the stairs and boom, like there they are. And so I'm like, are you waiting for me for hours? Like what is going on? So like in total, I think they ended up getting like 7,000 pesos out of just me. I don't know. And about, what's, I know the, what's got, the conversion there? How many dollars is 7,000 pesos? Uh, around 350. So like, so, not so they kind of corner you and and try to arrest you for something or plant something on you. That's how this happens. Yeah, the first time it was this giant bag of weed, and then like that's the thing is, if just with the reputation I have, if you try to tell people, if I try to tell people like the weed wasn't mine, like they just don't believe me. You know what I mean? Like, ah, oh, Jack, come on. But I was like, no, no, this really wasn't mine. This was this huge bag because if it's five grams or less or something, I don't know what the laws are. And then after that, it started to get worse. They didn't plant anything on me, but they just said like, I smelled like weed. And then, so they checked me and I didn't have my passport on me and it's never enforced. Or I've never seen it, but I guess it's technically a law that if you're a foreigner, you're supposed to have a form of identification on you, like at all times, like either your FM2, your, your residency or your passport. I didn't have either of them on me. But like I just, like i don't know anyone from, like you know what i mean you, just, you don't yeah. do that it's like it, it's never i've never actually had anyone ask me for it so then they pretended they were going to arrest me for that and i kind of tried to resist except like uh, they push it to where they uh i, I didn't want to try to call their bluff i'm like man they might try to take me down and do something so then they got me a second time and then on the third time that's when like right when <laughs> right when i crossed the, the like the the the, the corner and then i saw him i just went and i ran and then there's one thing i do know in mexico is that it, they're very strict with the police coming into your house without uh i don't know what to call it here but basically a search warrant sure. so the guy actually tried to follow me into my house so man I, 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 it doesn't sound like something i normally do but it, i turned around and i pushed him on his ass and then that's when i started to record and i was so mad but man the thing is when when you get that emotional my spanish went out the window so it's like the worst spanish in the world <laughs> but but yeah and then what i got lucky though was is that they were saying i was a liar and they were they were going to call uh, uh like other people to come or whatever is my neighbor's son came out and they had robbed him just a couple days before so then it like really turned into this neighborhood thing so it's not even all recorded, but like they actually started to kind of get mobbed with like the local like people of the building. And then they just left and they never come like back to my building. The only time I've ever seen them is once on the corner in front of this, this thing called OXO. It's basically like 7-Eleven. And like, I just like avoided all con eye contact. Like <laughs> I didn't want to mess with them. Yeah. But besides well, my, that- like, My Spanish isn't very problem. good, but I definitely can hear you saying ridiculoso, which I assume means <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, You're calling out the police and I- I just yeah. worry for your safety when you're doing this. No, I don't think they're going to do anything. Cause again, it, as bad as it is, is like, you have to worry more about uh, police corruption in like, like a Vario or something where I live. It's like this middle-class area. So like, they just, they don't, they don't want to bring anything down on that voting block like that. Like there's political things. So I'm actually You're I saying they're, okay. they're not going to make you disappear or anything like that. That's something something mm -hmm. we have to worry about. No, I highly doubt it just because I get it just it would turn into an incident form in an area that it shouldn't like where you really have to worry about the police in Mexico is like in honestly, the poorer areas. Like if you're in a tapito or something yeah. like they might get you. But like in Del Valle, like I'm surprised they even took it that far, like I, I don't think they, I thought that they didn't think I would like escalate it to the level I did or anyone in my building really. 
so but yeah no where i live you're it, yeah like the, the it just that stuff usually doesn't happen like does it do these incidents make you think about moving back to the u.s no because like as bad of a reputation as the police have in mexico i've actually had an equal amount of like good uh uh incidences i guess with them and like especially the police over around me like when we like uh they have this thing in mexico where like they'll mark outside your house with these different symbols and that means that your target get robbed so like we in my building we found all these cars were getting broken into the the symbols were being written and like if there's like three little lines it's like a single female home alone or whatever so I, I got the circle in front of mine, which is just like they have something in there to rob or at least believe so. Like a couple people got the three little squiggly lines. And so like people were like worried, like, oh man, like it, that like a neighborhood watch was formed, the whole thing. But then the police came down and they caught the people like quick. And like, I was like giving them chili dogs. I gave like the police, not those specific police, but then like the ones that caught them. We gave them birthday cake and everything. Like we had a really good relationship. So like in general, like I've I've actually had mainly good run-ins with the police of Mexico, but it's just like it. it it's just like it, there's good, bad, like on anything. When sure. Mexico is the land of extremes, like you get like super cops, and then you get like those like ones that'll extort you. Like so, but so, no, no plans to move back to the U.S. is what you're saying. No, no, I really like it down here. And like, again, Mexico gets a bad reputation. Most of the time that you're, uh, you hear about these like crazy things happening in Mexico, it's pretty much the border towns. Like it's the drug routes. You know what I mean? Like if you're not in like, so the, the areas that are actually crazy in Mexico that it has a reputation for, they're very easy to avoid. And like, besides that, like where I live, like it's no more dangerous than like a New York City or Chicago or something like for the most part. They, <clears throat> well, one of the great things about what, what you do is Mexico's amazing if you're a professional wrestler. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, it is. You got a lot of places to work. Well, no, not only that is there's nowhere that lucha, luchadors are more over than in the barrio. So like it, it you do have a little bit I like of uh i don't want to say protection because you know you still something could happen but like a lot of times in, in places that like maybe you should be a little bit like more weary of whatever you'll be over as hell because like i said like just the barrio is where lucha libre is the most popular so like you'll go to tapito and you'll be like a little bit scared or whatever and then half people recognize you like you'll be super over and like so so when you talk about like, you know, retirement might be a few years away, do you think about what you're going to do after you're done wrestling? Uh, no, not really. And honestly, I'm not like a very ambitious person. So I just want some kind of little business that just kind of uh, can pay for all my bills and, and like for the needs of my kids. And then I'm just happy with that. Like, I don't. I don't know, man. I would, you say you're not that ambitious of a person, but you can't have the career that you've had in pro wrestling if you don't have some sort of ambition. Yeah, well, maybe at one point, but I, I feel like now I'm very much more like, like, I just want to like chill or whatever. Like, I don't, uh, there's no, there's no like, uh, I don't know what's the word for it. There's just no need to like, try to be anything, you know, other than like, just have the basic necessities uh, paid for. Well, it also sounds like you've done everything you want to do in your career. Yeah, I did a lot more. When I first started wrestling, like uh, going to Dragon Gate was like, I'm done. I don't need anything more than this. And then like, so I don't want to be one of those guys that uh, no matter what you get, you're never happy with it or whatever. Like, so I am pretty happy with what I've done. You know what I mean? Like I didn't freaking reach the top of the top or whatever, but like I've had like 20 years now of like a decent amount of relevancy and like, and I, you know what I mean? I, it got to travel a lot of places it's paid the bills for like you know like most of the time a lot of wrestlers especially back in the day it, indies pay a little bit better now so maybe there's some guys surviving off it but like wrestling wouldn't pay the bills until late into your career 
And like, I was lucky enough within like the first like five years of wrestling or something, it, it became my primary job or whatever. Yeah. So like, yeah, I, I, I really kind of just content with how things have been. So like, not that if anything came along, I'd just like ignore it or, you know what I mean? But like, I, I'm not, I don't this know. Seems to I, be a, this seems to be a theme with everything we've talked about is you just have this like bliss, this contentment with just everything. You're just like, yeah, you know, I, it's all good. <laughs> yeah no the, well, i know but i I always like I, I feel like that makes me sound like i'm lazy which <laughs> i just called myself lazy but like yeah i really am just kind of content with how things are and like uh, like my my little apartment right in this like middle class area of mexico city is paid for like you know, i've gotten a lot out of wrestling so like uh, i'm not really I'm not really worried about like trying to become like the millionaire superstar or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm well, when you're wearing shirts thing. like that though. I think we expect you to be a millionaire superstar. Okay. You, you know what, actually with this kind of style, never mind. Never mind. Okay. What was your Where's job my big ass before? contract? Where's my, I'm wearing the shirt of slickness <laughs> people. This is worth a million dollars. You know that. <laughs> what was your job before but, wrestling started paying the bills? Um, I was, Technically, it had a cool sounding name, but it wasn't uh, at this place called Torrey Composites of America. I was a lab technician. But what that really was, was stirring these samples of composite fiber all day and then moving what was essentially toxic waste. And it wasn't a bad job, but man, there's this thing called NMP. I don't remember what it stood for, but I put one of the barrels down too hard and the cap wasn't on all the way and it splashed into my eye and oh my goodness, I have never experienced pain like that before. Oh my God. So like the, there was that. And like this is a toxic chemical in your eye. Yeah, it's, it's called NMP. I cannot I'm going to look this up. It stands for, yeah, NMP. And it's used for um, like whatever, like the resin or whatever it is, the, uh, like binds composite fibers together. It's N -N -P? used yeah like the letters i and uh it's used to like break that is down it, is it npp no nmp oh, for N -N sure yeah okay. and it, so it's used to like break the resin down of composite fibers or whatever and like yeah if you get that in your eye it's freaking next N level methyl two pyrolidone yes i believe that is it yeah and well, then so yeah i think I you want that in your eyeball no and like that's why safety precautions are very so important because i didn't i was wearing my goggles on my head like i was too cool like it was i was like it was so again this is a recurring theme it was once again my fault like <laughs> and then i didn't have the cap on all the way and i slammed it down like and like yes so anytime it's a hazarded wa hazardous waste is what i'm learning here from google yeah yeah no it's definitely hazardous waste uh, it's uh, especially after you mix it in with the composite fiber it has like that resin mixed in with it too and then so you're dumping all that out and then like and then i was also i was a pizza delivery boy for a little bit and i worked at jack in the box uh i did data entry for a little bit which was actually probably my funnest job i actually because you back in the day i don't know how to do it now but you used to have a little pedal when you did data entry that would rewind whatever you were listening to and then so like i don't know you could just play a little stupid game if you got bored with that thing and then uh, I'm trying to think what else. Well, yeah, Jack was, all, was all this in California? No, no, Washington. Oh, this is Washington. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I can imagine after getting hazardous waste in your eyeball that you're like, all right, I'm, I'm happy to be yeah. making money. Yeah, oh, so painful. So painful. But there's actually Tabasco in your eyeballs. Not quite as bad, but it hurts almost as bad as NMP. Because when I was a, in Mexico for the very first couple of years, we were heels, me and Ted. And in Ciudad de Juarez, they're the, like, they're, if you're a, a Technico, they're the best crowd ever. If you're a Rudo, you're in some pretty <laughs> trouble. Because I just remember we had lost the match. We're going to the back. We're doing that. Oh, yeah, you suck. Oh, I hate you. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And a lady tapped me on the shoulder. And I turned around to a cup full of Tabasco sauce right in my eyes. And like, oh my goodness, it took like a good 10 minutes of pure splashing water in my eye and everything to get that. Like that was super painful. Wow. So, but yeah, so Ciudad de Juarez, if you're a technical, it's one of the most Damn. enjoyable experiences. If you're a Rudo, 
Do not listen to anyone tapping on your shoulder after the match is over. Get your ass to that locker room. You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's the hair that we're seeing right now the result of the match that you had with Orange Cassidy? Uh, kind of. The, I, it actually grew out like even a little bit longer than this. And then my girl, she uh, loves when I have blonde streaks. And so I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. But oh, you get this is a man, another recurring theme. This was totally my fault. You get what you pay for. I went to the cheapest little place, like a couple blocks away from my house. And like, I don't know how it, you could just tell they didn't know what they were doing. And so the, I had them do the little die job thing. And the lady ends up like talking to some other lady and she's just doing other stuff. And she told me, like, I think 30 or 45 minutes, I can't remember. And then she had to take off this little like net like thing that they were like poking it all through yeah, for like highlights yeah 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 for highlights well she did it must i'm talking it was over an hour maybe an hour and 15 minutes and like god this is <laughs> the stupid jack like i, I was just being too nice because i i should have been like lady it is way too long take this thing off of me yada 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 but I was just like, oh, well, I'll, I'll just take it. She knows what she's doing. And uh, like, I'm like submissive almost this lady. I don't know what was wrong with me. <laughs> and she took it off. And like some parts were like white. And then some were a little bit like coppery and then blonde. And like my, uh, not only that, my head, it was just uh, like I had the worst dandruff anyone's ever seen. Like you could, I could just like brush my hair with my hand and i'm talking snowflakes like crazy style and then like uh it looked so bad that just a couple days later i went and i just got it all shaved off to the point of oh, like so another hair cold. versus hair match basically <laughs> yeah but th this one was like hair versus hair salon match <laughs> and then so and then oh it, it was so bad and then the thing is okay I, I was like so mad and then i was even more mad at myself because like i said it was like being submissive like man why don't i just tell her to take it i'm, not, I'm gonna go tell that lady da, 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 da. and the one day i'm walking the wife my wife's friends with the lady and then so i was like oh no i can't even say anything like i want to get my little like i gotta get the last word in style or something i gotta tell this lady off like look what you did da, 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 da. and i couldn't like she's friends with my wife and she orders the stuff better wear from her and i was like oh god so so that, needless to say, you've shaved your head twice in the last year or so. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that second time was like, it basically it, the big dip with like the, the razor because even when it, uh, the clippers were at their lowest, it still had these little spots. And like, just, oh, I don't know, wow. it was bad. But the thing that sucked is it literally it damaged my scalp because even when it was completely shaved as bald as you could get it, there I'd just be walking around and like, there'd be like, flaky chunks of like dead skin that would come off my head like yeah it was yeah. so now, now yeah, you kind of no. look like uh dave portnoy the barstool guy you know what i'm talking about <laughs> dave, why no it does sound familiar no in the show i don't know if you ever seen it i feel like i look like oops. i'm gonna show you max Payne from max Payne three <laughs> oh sure yeah <laughs> i mean but, this this might be a it's just i think the hair and the beard but uh this guy Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could be like his uh, stunt double, I think. Oh, yeah. Wait, if he need, I, I'm down. I'm down. I need work. Dave, get a hold of me. <laughs> Dave has a lot of money. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, at what point in your life, because I don't think it was probably in your wrestling career, but at what point in your life did you realize I can do really acrobatic stuff? Um, well, early on, because my sister, sorry, I got to blow my nose. This interview has it all. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a disgusting interview, like talking about flaky, <laughs> like this interview has cells on my head, blowing my nose. Um, early on, because my sister was in gymnastics, and then she taught me a lot <coughs> of like, <clears throat> like and she was essentially taught me the back handspring, and then I took it from there. But when I knew I could do like. You know, not, maybe not gymnast levels, but like I was really good at it was when I got into break dancing because you had a lot of other people that could do acrobatics and stuff. Sure. And even though like I wasn't as good as like the, the air tracks, air flares uh, and all that, like, uh, and, and of course, like Washington's in this strong break dance scene, but uh, like I was even better than them. And that's when I realized like, oh man, I actually like, you know, again, I'm not the top level gymnast, but I got a lot of acrobatic skill. It was when I got into break dancing.
You know, there's a video online. There's a video on YouTube. Actually, it's a series on YouTube called "How Isn't Jack Evans?" <laughs> yeah, but, uh, Which I yeah. think is a pretty appropriate question to ask. Oh man, when it comes to that cage of death bump, I agree. But uh, oh, uh, dude, you I landed on your head. Yeah, or no, no. It, on that one, I actually ended up landing on like my tailbone. And it literally, it like must have cracked my tailbone or something. Cause I'm talking and it was just shortly before like Blitzkrieg is like my favorite wrestler ever. I don't know if you remember from WCW. Yeah. I was getting his gimmick like two days later after that happened, but only after this match was super dragon and all this stuff. So, uh, it, uh, I like, Oh, I had this cracked tailbone and I had to go on and do a match. I'm pretty sure it was super dragon who is like, uh, he's not near as rough as they say, like stiff wise. But it's a, a rough match with Super Dragon. And then, but even like uh, just to get like the Blitzkrieg outfit and everything, and like the original Blitzkrieg came out and handed it to me and all that. Uh, but even then, for like two months after, like I just can't explain how bad, like essentially my ass hurt. I'm sorry, this interview is getting bad, but but man, that that that, that tailbone, it freaking killed for so long. So that that was one of the worst bumps. Was that of your my worst career. injury? No, I'd say my worst one was uh, I broke my leg actually in front of Chris Benoit, uh, and, and like I ended up having to get. I don't know if you can see it, but like there's oh, yeah. I had their plates and screws and the whole thing. And then uh, in Japan, I broke my face, uh, and I had to. I've I don't even remember how many now, but plates and screws in my face because it broke my orbital and then like pushed it over through my nasal and then like uh oh uh it was so swollen and everything but it was in osaka and osaka is the best party city anyone's ever seen in their life so i was determined to go out that night like i didn't go to the hospital or anything with this huge puffy face that i knew was broke and i ended up getting el generico sammy Zayn, to come out with me ends up he doesn't even drink or anything so like i was like Oh, it was one of those pathetic moments. I'm like, dog, trying to go to the freaking Osaka clubs, like not by myself. Sammy's there. Well, like he's not drinking. I'm drinking by myself. Like I'm trying to dance on girls with this swollen face. Like, I don't know what I was thinking on that one. And then, uh, but what I was lucky was we had to fly home, like I think two days later or whatever, maybe three days. And uh, I, I still, I hadn't gone to the doctor or anything like. Uh, and I'm sure uh, flying doesn't help that at all. Well, no, actually, I was told it's very dangerous to fly like that. Yeah. Like, what well, I didn't know it at the time. But the stewardess, actually, me and Human Tornado, who was the guy that ended up breaking my, or who had broken my face, uh, it wasn't his fault. I don't want to make it sound like that. It was a complete accident. Uh, but she moved us up to first class because when she saw it, she was just, like, almost disgusted. Like, you need to go uh, maybe up, up to first class. It looks like you might be in some pain. Like, uh, And then I got to take Human Tornado with me. And then uh, when I got home, though, the doctors were so mad at me for flying without getting it checked out and, like, put in place and everything. And, like, so, it, but, yeah, it ended up being this huge surgery and blah, 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 blah. And then, but, you know, what was more the most painful thing out of that whole thing is right after the surgery, I had the big, you know, like, swollen face, not allowed to blow your nose or anything because of the pressure, but... I was walking to go get something to the kitchen and I turned around and I hit my like that part of the face on the side of like a door frame and literally blood splurt through my eyelid. And Oh, it looked like I was crying blood. Like I even took a picture. If my space was still around, it would still be there. And I was like, look, I'm crying blood. I'm every goth girl's dream. But like, it actually, it hurts so bad, but literally like, like horror movie style. Like it's, burst out like from underneath my eyelid oh. like, and and like that hurt worse than the actual injury that was so painful i really so, do think this is an appropriate question like this whole compilation is you landing on your head from like various different heights and the question yeah. is like how aren't you dead yet like yeah well i'll tell you how about that because that was when you i was know young. how many concussions you've had no, I, but like, in all honesty, most of my injuries haven't usually been head injuries. They've like that one was, I don't, I don't actually feel like I got concussed from that though. Cause it wasn't like loopy, but there was for sure, even though it wasn't diagnosed. Cause like, they just didn't like back in the day, like in the early to mid two thousands, 
no one was actually really thinking about concussions. Like, I mean, obviously you knew they existed, but it wasn't like today where like, if you get a concussion, like, like again, AEW handles that so well. Like if you even think you're concussed, like no questions asked, go ahead and take your time off, do your thing. You're not going to get, you know, deep pushed or like, you know, looked up bad pun. And there used to be a completely different mentality where like in the early, like 2000s, again, it was like, what? Well, you got a concussion and you're taking time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was, yeah. but uh, so, but there was one in ROH where I did a bad 630 on top of a chair. And then there was one uh, in the Blitzkrieg outfit against Super Dragon at an indie in California where I did a, uh, man, I was just way too blown up. I shouldn't have gone for it. I knew I should have gone for it. But uh, I did a bad corkscrew 630 and I ended up like knocking myself out. And so those are the only two for sure I know of, but I'm willing to bet just over all the years, there's been like some more, but those, those are the two like major ones, but most of my injuries actually are to my legs and specifically my ankles. Like I've really like a lot of high flyers. I find like they get bad knees, like, like Ray Mysterio or whatever, you know, usually he has that problem with the knees or whatever. I, I got bad ankles so like I have this thing as the one it's the right one on the one I got surgery on where it sounds so dumb but I have to be careful there are curbs because sometimes and, and, the, and there's no rhyme or reason to it but my ankle just loses strength it doesn't balance itself so like I'll be walking up to a curb and like I just won't be able to like if I'm not if it's just hanging off the curb by a little bit I'll literally like just fall and collapse like into the street and like, it, it's like, again, I know it sounds so stupid, but it's actually been the thing where like, I've almost actually gotten myself hit by cars and everything. So like, if you ever Man. see me walking slow or staying away from a curb, I know it sounds dumb, but like, there's a reason for it. Like, so I, I've, my ankle, my right ankle specifically is bad. So th th that's where I've gotten most of my injuries. Well, that, so that's the answer. That is the answer to the yeah. question, how isn't Jack Evans dead yet? Yeah. Well, no, and the family, because the thing is, is before I, well, A, it was kind of the, like, meta. I don't know if that, like, that's what you would call it in gaming. I don't know if that works in wrestling, but it's kind of the style back in the day, uh, in my day, was, like, big stunts, big bumps. And then, like, now I find that, like, that's not as much the style, so, like, you don't really need to do it. And the family because now i'm just not willing to take the risks i was before because yeah. back in the day if worse came to worse and like i was hurt out of couldn't work or anything like i could move it back in with my parents like you know it'd be embarrassing but it was an option yeah. but now like when i moved back with my parents and i'm just like okay family take care of yourself you know what i mean so like now that the family has put this like like fear of getting injured that's like more than conscious like so like i i literally if you were to ask me to climb up on the cage and do the double move so like i did in scramble cage madness again like my mind and body physically wouldn't let me do it like they just like don't no, no man if you get injured what are you you know you got kids da, 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 da. Yeah. so uh, the reason jack evans isn't dead is the family for sure because it just you, you just you can't just keep being a knucklehead when you you got people relying on you that makes sense. Not long after you debuted in AEW, X Pac was on his podcast and he had so many like very nice things to say about you. And oh, I, I didn't realize this. Today. I don't think a lot of people realize that you guys lived together. Oh, yeah. We lived together for a year, year and a half, maybe. Like, but oh, yeah. He's one of the, 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 the man. And this is the weird thing I find on the internet uh, with a lot of fans, he has a different reputation compared to the person he actually is. 100 percent like i've never seen before like one of the most caring realist individuals i've ever seen like yeah he's such a sweetheart dude like i i used to joke around that he's the male mother Teresa. that he because he literally like if he saw a homeless guy he'd give him money taking him to oxo we find him sandwiches like uh like but man also a guy that is just <laughs> just stupid shit happens to him like man there's one time he got drunk and he went into no he wasn't even drunk i'm sorry he was drinking but it wasn't even a drunken mess or anything and he went into an alley and like just was pissing and the police rushed him and he got extorted and all this stuff and it was like what i've never seen that happen like so he's a guy that like he's the nicest guy in the world but also like i swear to god there's like a gray rain cloud that follows him around like so this is in mexico he was living with you yeah Yep, in Mexico. 
and it was uh i think right before, no no i'm sorry it was right after triple a because yeah he got signed to triple a and then triple a actually paid for a house for me this guy moody jack conan and x Pug. and then so like that just became uh, <laughs> almost like a wrestler flop house but it, it was fun times definitely fun times but I, yeah I just, I just what do you think living so? x Pug was like man i've never met a person like uh, with the such a caring person to like the next level i have nothing but good things to say about x Pug. when you get to live with someone like that and pick his brain what do you think is the biggest thing you learn actually it was i should have picked it more x Pac needs to be a trainer or anything he actually knows so so much but uh w- one thing i remember taking away from him uh, well i didn't actually learn it i i remember witnessing him able to do it he would be able to go to a show and I don't know how, but almost like divination or something, he would be able to read what kind of crowd it was. So like when you were wrestling with X-Pac, it was the best because you'd be like, oh yeah, this is a crowd. You're going to want to do your dives. You're going to want to do that. And like, it would work. And then like, he'd say, oh no, they just want comedy. Da, 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 da. And then like, he'd just do these comedy spots and it would work. So one thing I, I, I remember taking away from Xbox, even though I don't want to, I didn't really learn it. I just wasn't on the ball again, but it's like, you really have to realize that like there's different kinds of shows, like, because I, I just can't do like, I'd go to a show and I'd just be doing six thirties and Sasuke specials and it'd be nothing. And next pop would like have one where he like gets a guy in a, a full Nelson and the guy like gets to the feet with his ropes. And then when the ref counts to four, x just comedically let him go and the guy will like fall to his back roaring huge laughter da, da, da. so like x he really knew actually how to read and control a crowd way more than he gets credit for as where i'd always go out and be like you know what i mean like oh i'm gonna be you know the car crash scene like i'm, I'm bringing the action like x would know and who else had this with Carol guayo it was so good at it is he would just be able to read a crowd like he'd know what kind of people you were wrestling in front of and what they wanted to see like to an extent i've never i don't think i've seen anyone else Mm -hmm. so like i always loved feuding with x-pac because uh uh, he just no matter where you were like he knew how to get you over because again i don't know how he could do it but he just had this weird connection where he just knew the kind of people you're wrestling like he knew, are they going to want the craziness? Are they going to want comedy? Do they want crowd interaction? He was actually the one, I, in Mexico, I started interacting with the crowd much more than I did in America. And he was the one that taught me that because uh, especially in Mexico, he was like, it's actually very important to make sure you go to the crowd and you make them uh, the, kind of like the sixth man. Hmm. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I was not the sixth man, but you know what I mean? Like, sure. Include them. So, yeah, I, I remember learning that from x Or no, Again, I didn't learn I'm witnessing him doing it, but like... Yeah, yeah. Ah. You, yeah you learned it like by osmosis almost. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, do, I don't have it to like that extent at all. Like, I, I, I don't even think I'm describing like just how good he really was at it. Like, so like you'd be in a small town and you, he would just listen to you and like, okay, we're going to do this and then I'm going to 450 off the apron on the submit, da, da, da. And he'd just be like, look, you don't need any of that. Like here, this is what you do to get over them. Do this spot, this spot, this spot. And it would just work better than your plan. So even though you were more complicated, uh, doing crazier, higher risk stuff, it just wouldn't get over to the extent as whatever X-Pac told you. Man. Like, yeah, he was, he was so good at that. So good at that. Do you think with everything you did in your career that you really got the momentum when you started getting the exposure from Lucha Underground? <clears throat> uh, to a certain extent, I feel like Lucha Underground was almost like a uh, like a relaunch for me because I feel like in America at least I was like almost forgotten a bit. You know what I mean? Like it's like oh yeah, he was that guy in ROH and did yeah. double rooms all da da da. And I feel like Lucha Underground like reminded people of my existence in America almost. So uh oh, I'm getting a call. Hold oh, on. I told you Hello? this interview has everything. Bueno, Stardust. Ah, no, no necesito. Gracias. Nos vemos. Sorry, that was the uh, 
house cleaning. They wanted to know when I needed to have the room clean. We'll, we'll cut that out. Okay. <laughs> with, yeah. with all that said, again, this interview has had everything. This is amazing. I appreciate your, your self-awareness through everything. Like, you know what you bring to the table, whether that's in wrestling or in life. And I don't think, I think that's a gift. There are very few people that are as self-aware as you are. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Because I, I really do honestly try to be like realistic with my situation. Like, you know, I don't want to go out there and pretend to be something I'm not or try to hype myself up. So no, thank you. I, I guess I try. And I want to know. I think I learned that from my dad because that's how my dad is. My dad is very like honest with his faults and uh, everything. So that, that's also, actually why I got it. I also want to thank you for guiding me through that segment that we did because you know we talked about it a bunch and it was written one way and it ended up being a different way. And I remember we were all we were all rehearsing this um, before the show, and you're like, "Oh, I'll just come out the entrance way and like be yelling." And I'm like, that sounds amazing. And then when yeah. we were on live TV, there's you know 15 or 20,000 people in the arena and you're yelling and we can you know barely hear you. I thought it was so <laughs> interesting how it all ended up looking on yeah, television. But it was good. I was just, it, oh man, actually Joey Janela, I don't know if you remember, he was marking out the biggest because he was like the biggest clerks nerd there's ever been. But for me, I've always been a Jay and Silent Bob guy because uh, it, me and my friend Tony, like that was, we used to like hang outside of 7 Eleven and drink Slurpees and everything. So <laughs> we'd get compared to Jay and Silent Bob all the time. So, like, it, it was, and I, I know I'm, not, I'm a big fan of like, especially Dogma is one of my favorites. I know that's not what, and I think I'm the one person in the world that thinks Small Rats is a good movie. <laughs> but, uh, but so I, I was marking out during that whole thing. So I, I'm just happy that it went well because I was like, oh man, this is badass. I was hoping though, my dream was that, uh, oh man, what was it? Blunt Man. And uh, I, I wanted to wrestle their alternative uh, or their alter egos. Uh, the super Blunt Man. Oh, I can't remember the other one. And, uh, oh, there was, it's Blunt Man and something. I'm, it, I'm going blank. So I was hoping that somehow it would lead actually to a match with, uh, Jason Hughes and but uh, and Kevin Smith, but it didn't. But so, but I, I that was actually a really fond memory for me, just because it was such a like I was such a Kevin Smith fan of his movies and everything. So yeah, that was well, thank you, thank you. Now I think what was so interesting is we went over that with and Christopher Daniels was the one who kind of had the plan for that. We yeah. went over that like so many times. Like it's gonna go like this. It's gonna go like this. We're gonna do, and we thought it was gonna be on this side of the arena, and it ended up being on the other side of the arena. Yeah. Then we go backstage when Kevin and Jason arrived, and the entire segment completely changes. Can I be honest? I knew, I knew from the start it was because those things never go as planned. That's why I always think on those ones they just need a general outline, and then it's got to be improv because yeah. a, a lot of times if you try to uh, uh, get it, what is it like? Like too much down, like, like if you try to make it like a movie scene where like the dialogue's written and da 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 da, it's actually going to mess people up when something goes, you know, like you know, t -t uh, off off the rails or whatever. But it, so it was like, episode yeah, one, though. Yeah, it was episode one of the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but no, I I uh, I think it still went really well. But yeah, no, I knew I was like in my mind, I was like, it's never actually going to go like this. It just these things don't do that. Like not in wrestling, like. What do you think is your AEW highlight? Um, I, in all honesty, that might be it. If for just memorability, just because uh, it's so rare that you know you're going to work with Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes like that. But for me, my AEW highlight, like match wise, would man, actually, my favorite match might be that one with like the best friends. So yeah. Like, uh, I don't yeah. So like, I didn't have very many like classics or, or i don't think i had any like classics and then i would say kenny my singles with kenny omega which is actually on a dark except man oh that kenny omega match it should have been one of those like six star classic kenny omega match styles or whatever i was so out of shape and then like so i, I was like in a neurotic i was a neurotic mess like putting that match together with him because the whole time I'm trying to tell him <laughs> god we're like kind of insinuating to him like I'm going to be blown up. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this, but I, I didn't want to, it, it was all, it almost, it could have been like a big break if I had hit a home run on that match. Mm. So like a lot of people put that match over as being great. And it was like, it, it was pretty good, but 
it should have been so much more. We had to cut so much out. So much was not executed properly. And like that one right there, again, the recurring theme was 100% my fault. I was so out of wrestling shape that I just, he literally, he, he just outworked me to such an extent where like we, we actually had to end the match early because I was just like, I'm done. Like, so that, so the Kenny Omega match is both a highlight for me and like one of my biggest AEW regrets because like, oh, I, I shouldn't have fallen off so far where I couldn't handle the match at all the way Kenny wanted it. Like that really should have been a classic. So, and so it came off good. I still like the match and everything like, but that one specifically actually kind of like hurts me. because I'm like, man, that actually could have been like a career maker. Like, again, if I was more of an ambitious person, I swear to God. But like, I just, oh, it, oh, that one breaks my heart. Cause it really, I'm telling you, if it would have, everything would have been executed just, you know, at a at 100% rate where you're not like half ass mint, like yeah. you're like really selling, you're not doing the, or, or, or like you're, you're resting selling, you're not doing the real sell, you're actually gasping for air. Like, yeah. <laughs> and if we would have gotten everything, it, it, I'm telling you, the match is supposed to be a good like five to 10 minutes longer than it was. And so uh, I, I actually, I would say that my Kenny Omega match is both my highlight and my biggest regret of my run in AEW. Because, like, it, it really should have been a career-defining match. And also, all it did was define, like, literally how badly out of wrestling shape I was. Like so Midway through the match, were you like, let's take it home? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, 100%. Yeah, I was, I was done. And the thing is, in comparison to, like, some of those old Dragon Gate matches and stuff, we didn't, we weren't, like, going 100%. We weren't doing all this crazy stuff. So, like it was just extra embarrassing because it was like, it, 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 it showed me and I think the office and the world. Well, I mean, not the world. I don't think a lot of people realize what match was supposed to be, but uh, like, honestly, how far I'd fallen because man, if you were watching like these old dragon game matches with like Shima and dragon kid and everything. And then like, you saw like what had to get cut out in that match and be like, Oh wow. Jack's really come, like, what's wrong with him? Like he, he's not going like he used to. And it 100% would be true. So, huh. yeah. Well, I'm going to let you get back to the family and the kids. And I appreciate us being able to catch up and yeah. the, the adventure we've been on today with the Wi-Fi and the hotel and everything here. Oh yeah. I, I know most that's going to get cut. Fans, you don't know what I did for you. I ran a couple miles around this hotel just to get my wife's phone to get this freaking interview done properly. So. We did it. We did it. Okay. So, thank you. And speaking yeah. of that, I, I end every interview with gratitude because I wake up every morning. I say out loud three things that I'm grateful for. So for you, Jack, what are three That's... things in your life that you're grateful for? Uh, I'm grateful for wrestling in general. It really has allowed me to have like a, uh, an eventful life that I don't think there's anything else in the world that I was even half decent at that would have allowed it. Uh, I'm definitely grateful for the, the the family and the kids just because like, I, uh, again, they just give me like a, a feeling and an experience that is like nothing else. And then third, um, Oh God, I feel like I should be grateful for so much. And now I'm going blank. Um, no, third, you know, what? I'm just, I'm grateful to Mexico because actually, you know, for being a foreigner and everything in Mexico, how much the Mexican people and everything has accepted me and everything. Like I, I, I always, uh, I love that. I feel like I'm people like me more here than in my own country. So, uh, and I'm grateful to Mexico. Well, we like you. We like you, Jack. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter might disagree with you on that one, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't just base it off the you know the few bad comments no 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 oh no and that's actually another thing not to keep running on but a lot of people uh and no i do thank them the, it's like someone will be rude you know on twitter like when i i, I send my like goodbye message or whatever to AEW. but i'm like people you really have to take the good with the bad because like there's people that are just going to be like that and even with someone like uh like there's the channel AEW botches <laughs> whatever they are posting constant jack evans mess ups but like they're they're at the same time they're not lying like those were legitimate botches so i always tell people the same thing like you just gotta take the good with the bad yeah i think that's a great message to end with gotta take the good with the bad you do you do you if everyone's putting you over all the time you don't know where you really said it that's true well jack <laughs> i look forward to what's next for you 
all right I, hopefully good things it's all gonna be good things come on yeah 100%. as long as you're not dead you know according to yeah. these youtube videos yeah <laughs> yeah hopefully there I, I i love that someone made the, that series but hopefully there's no more how is jack evans not dead videos because I, I'm, I'm trying to trying to calm down the risks <laughs> jack appreciate you thank you so much no, appreciate you thank you